Good evening and uh, welcome to this pre-recorded Behind the Headlines for Wednesday the 24th of August uh, 2022. Uh, 50 years ago this week, the Munich Olympic Games opened uh, in a new Germany that was uh, West Germany. And uh, the last time the Olympics were held in Germany was in Berlin, 1936, under the Nazi regime. Uh, the Olympics uh, of 1972 all started well. They were the biggest Olympics to date, but sadly tragedy struck on the 5th of September, 1972 when a Palestinian terrorist belonging to the faction Black September, the PLO, uh, murdered two Israeli athletes and then uh, captured a further nine. Uh, sadly, this all ended as um, they escaped to the uh, international airport in Munich and were killed in a firefight. Nine Israeli athletes uh, were murdered uh, together with uh, five Palestinian terrorists and a, a West German uh, policeman was also killed. And this tainted the Olympic Games that was uh, Munich Olympic Games of 1972. And we are in this program tonight paying tribute to those Israeli athletes who were brutally murdered at the hands of the PLA. Uh, Reagan, it's, it's great to be doing a, a, a program on, on this topic, particularly as we mark the 50th anniversary of the massacre that was known as the Munich Olympic Games of 72. Yeah, what a tragedy. And as you, you said, this is actually fairly recently removed from the horrific events of World War II. West Germany is a democratic state. It's wanting to show that things have changed. It's moved on from its Nazi past. Um, you can go back to 1936 and, and the Fuhrer uh, Adolf Hitler um, was was very much uh, holding things in a tight grip at the time, just prior to um, the Holocaust, prior to World War II. And at this point now, uh, West Germany was thinking, okay, we, we, we can completely remove any negative connotations um, through holding, through hosting a really positive uh, Olympic Games here in Munich. Uh, and yet it was not to be. And yet again, tragedy um, struck not, not through this time the hands of um, Nazis or neo-Nazis, um, but through uh, these members of uh, a faction of uh, the PLO. So you look at it and you think this is going to potentially be something that can um, be a good redemptive moment we have Jewish Israeli athletes in West Germany. They're competing. Probably would have been one of the first times that you would have had that number of Israeli um, Jewish athletes competing in uh, West Germany uh, since since perhaps 1936. If there were any uh, Jewish athletes, I'm, I'm sure there would have been um, some, but they would have had to be very very quiet as uh, or or would have stood out and been heavily ostracized as many of the African-American uh, and other black athletes uh, were in Nazi Germany as well. But here we are and we have the uh, faction Black September uh, murdering and the security procedures to arrest the situation failed. No, absolutely. But it's also important to remind, as, as you said earlier, Reagan, that it was only really 27 years after the end of the Second World War, after the Holocaust, and uh, many of the Israeli athletes that were actually competing in the Munich Olympic Games of 72 were either survivors of the Holocaust mm. or had family members that perished in the Holocaust. So to actually then be back on German soil after 27 years and competing to actually for, for the nation of Israel, the Jewish state, uh, and actually wearing the, uh, the Magen David, the Star of David, yeah. and representing the Jewish state in Germany after everything that Germany was involved in w was, was quite something. There, there was a lot of discussion prior to the games and the Israeli uh, delegation felt that the Olympic village where the athletes were based, uh, their security wasn't safe. Now at that time you said earlier, uh, uh, and this is an important point to make, that the West German officials wanted to they didn't want any of their security guards to, to have guns. I think they only spent about two million pounds on security for the entire Olympic setup across all the major sports because they didn't want to give the impression of being like Germany was 
in the 1930s and 40s. So none of them were armed. Um, none of them had any kind of security protection. So there was a concern from the Israeli camp regarding security, but that con security concerns were, were overlooked. Uh, and and we actually think about the actual Munich uh, Olympics itself. It was the largest to date. Um, prior to 1972. Uh, 7,000 athletes took place from 121 competing re uh, nations and a record number of 195 events. The American swimmer Mark Splitz shines with seven gold medals and seven world records. I believe he is Jewish as well. Um, new sports include kayaking, uh, solemn, um, canoeing and men's indoor handball. And also archery makes its first appearance in 52 years as the Soviet gymnast Elga Korbort steals fans' hearts. Uh, but it was overall shadowed by what happened on the 5th of uh, September. Um, I mean, building in these games, I mean, it was, a, it was a big thing for West Germany because also we have to reconcile the fact that West Germany made uh, rec peace and reconciliation towards Israel in 1952. And we see that uh, West Germany was completely different from the Nazi regime uh, that was prior. So this was an opportunity really to show the world how different West Germany was. And we've got to also remember as well that, ge that Germany was divided between uh, democratic West West Germany mm -hmm. and also communist East Germany with uh, Berlin being its capital. Yeah, it's a crucial distinction. Now, what actually happened, let's look a little bit at the timeline. We have at 4.30 in the morning on September the 5th, 1972, five Palestinian terrorists wearing track sweatsuits very, you know, it would have been very normal for athletes to be up very early, doing warm-ups, doing um, exercises, going through some regimen. Um, the, the thing that wouldn't have been normal, or that it rather shouldn't have been normal, was that um, this, this group was spotted climbing over uh, the six foot six inch fence surrounding the Olympic Village. Now, uh, really, it's a bit of a small fence. You kind of think six foot six inch fence, uh, anyone could jump and grab hold of that and, and climb over. So it's not really a security deterrent. It actually sounds like it was almost more decorative um, than anything. Um, they were seen by several people, but no one thought anything was out of the ordinary or unusual. Again, because apparently the gates being locked, many athletes would hop the fence or perhaps they wouldn't want to go to the entrance and exit and thought, okay, it's, this is a shortcut, so we'll, we'll hop the fence. Not, not a great thing, but this is how they were able to get in um, w without anyone really raising the alarm. They were well disguised in their tracksuits. They hid their weapons in athletic bags. No one thought anything of it. The five who hopped the fence were then met by three more men who it seems that they had obtained some credentials somehow uh, that enabled them to, um, to to be in or perhaps who knows they may have hopped the fence um, elsewhere but they were already there uh, there were some stolen keys they were able to enter two apartments being used by the Israeli team at 31 Connolly um, Strade uh, the Israeli wrestling referee Yosef Gutfreund heard a faint scratching noise at the door of the first apartment. And when he investigated, he saw the door begin to open and mass men with guns on the other side. He shouted, Hevra Tistaku. I think I may have gotten the That's not bad. It's not too bad, I'm getting there. Um, guys, get out of here. And threw his nearly 300 pound, that's 135 kg frame against the door to try to stop the Palestinian terrorist from forcing their way in. In this confusion, thankfully, there were some who were able to escape. Uh, Coach Tuv Tuvia Sokolovsky and race walker Dr. Shaul Ladani escaped, and another four athletes, plus the two team doctors and delegation head Shmuel Lalkin, managed to hide. Uh, the wrestling coach, Moshe Weinberg, uh, attacked the kidnappers at the hostages as they were being moved uh, from one apartment to another, allowing one of his wrestlers, Gad Sabari, to escape. 
Uh, the burly Weinberg uh, knocked one of the intruders unconscious and stabbed another with a fruit knife before being shot to death. So it was a very bold, um, courageous endeavor that arguably saved another life uh, on, on his part, that being the um, Gad Sabari uh, wrestler. Weightlifter and father of three, Yosef Romano, 31, also attacked and wounded one of the intruders before being killed. Um, and then the Palestinian terrorists succeeded in rounding up nine Israelis, which they took as hostages. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, discussions regarding what happened uh, at Munich, uh, the lack of security there by the Olympic officials and the organisers of the Munich Olympic Games. Also, the, the way that the crisis situation was, was, was handled. Um, it was uh, Golda Meir, who was then Israel's uh, Prime Minister in 72. And uh, she didn't really want... There was a lot of pressure from the IDF, I think I remember, um, uh, reports I've read saying that they wanted to take charge of the, of the uh, hostage crisis because these were Israelis on German soil. But she insisted that the uh, the German police should handle it and they deal with it. But they um, they didn't have enough they didn't have enough guns. They underestimated how many Palestinian terrorists there were from Black September. And we also got to remember. Uh, I also acknowledge that Black September was a faction of the PLO, the Palestinian Liber Liberization Organization, um, that was, uh, and Yasser Arafat was the chairman. So you can't make a distinction between Black September and the PLO. So, I mean, this, w this was handled so badly. Um, and of course, then the terrorist demands were, we, need, we want to get on a plane, uh, get us to an airport so that we can fly with the hostages to Cairo. And that's what the uh, that's what uh, the, the the terrorists were actually demanding. I mean, you can just imagine this, can't you? This happening at the Olympic Games, the, the, the sports and everything else that was on stops. And this becomes the number one news story that uh, dominates uh, the, the games itself. At 9.30 a.m. they had announced that they were Palestinians. They were demanding the release of 200 Arab prisoners and that they be given safe passage, as you mentioned, out of um, Germany. So they wanted to go to an airport upon confirmation of these uh, prisoners. Um, being released, um, they, they would then release the hostages that they had taken. There were hours of tense negotiations and then it was agreed that, okay, well, we will concede to your demands. We'll take you um, to the NATO air base uh, that would have been at First and Feldbrook where uh, they would board an airplane which would then fly them and their hostages to Cairo. Uh, of course, this was a plan that was aimed at rescuing the hostages and instantly assassinating the um, abductors of these terrorists. The Israelis were taken by bus to the helicopters and flown to the airfield. During the transfer, the Germans discovered that there were eight terrorists instead of the five uh, that they expected. And, and one wonders, okay, uh, how, how was it that they thought there were five? It's because presumably there had been five who were seen who had hopped over the fence. Also perhaps, I, I don't know, maybe there was some intel that um, some were wounded or um, there was this guy who was knocked unconscious and others stabbed with a fruit knife. You can see it playing out. Some Chinese whispers, no one really knowing what's going on. Maybe the Palestinians even reported that there were five just to, to throw. Um, there, there are things that are unknown at the end of the day when it comes to um, this situation, but regardless, you would think, okay, there's, uh, we have, we're expecting five, we're going to plan for 10. We're going to double up on e each of these individuals. And then if you have eight, it's no surprise, you can have everyone in target, you can have everyone in range, and you can carry out uh, the necessary mission um, for, for rescue at that moment. They had not assigned enough marksmen. This was the problem. They, it would seem, only had a few marksmen on, on hand um, to actually um, get, get rid of the terrorists at the airport. Um, this is a situation that's pretty dire. You need 
a man-to-man -man type scenario in order to make sure that this is successful and that all of your hostages uh, are safe and, and to ensure that um, you have clear shots with, um, with deadly accuracy. Absolutely, and you also want to extend negotiations as long as you can as well. Yeah. Um, so it buys you more time, it gives you an opportunity then to assess the situation, yes. get the right intelligence, and then make calm, rational decisions. And of course, the reaction of the German police force was not calm. There's nothing calm rational. about this. Yeah, it was just, just absolute chaos. Well, we, uh, we've got a special uh, treat in store for you. We have a very, very special guest on uh, this edition of, of Behind the Headlines, and uh, uh, we're gonna introduce you to him now. Uh, we now have a very special guest joining us on Behind the Headlines. His name is Professor Shaw Ladany. Uh, not only is he a professor at uh, Ben Gurion University and has incredible academic credentials, uh, he was also uh, an Olympic athlete and also a survivor of Bergen Belsen, the Holocaust. Um, Shaw, absolute pleasure to have you on uh, Behind the Headlines. How are you today, my friend? First, second. Uh, thank you very much for having me on your program. Uh, I have never been on your program, and that's a, an honor for me. <laughs> Trust me, the, the honor is all, all ours. Thank you, uh, Shul. Uh, Shul, can you just explain to us uh, your extraordinary life um, growing up, uh, being born in, um, in what is now modern-day Serbia, in, in Belgrade, uh, and your first experiences of the German Luftwaffe uh, bombing Belgrade, which is the uh, capital of uh, modern Serbia today. Yes, I was at that time at age five. Then, then it was Yugoslavia. You probably know the, the, the joke that a person lived in four countries and never moved from the house in which he was born. Only the borders moved. <laughs> so now it is uh, Serbia, uh, 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 age five, and uh, uh, we were all in the laundry room in the basement level of our house. Uh, neighbors considered our house a very strong house, modern uh, villa uh, made of reinforced concrete, entered into the adjacent large basement. I remember once huge noise, the building shaked. My grandmother fell on me to protect me. The <clears throat> uh, iron door was not out of its hinges. It fell on my grandmother, but nothing really serious happened to us in the laundry room. Uh, a bomb uh, fell diagonally on the rear side, entered the second floor, first floor, into the uh, adjacent uh, big basement. Several people were killed there. These were my first uh, uh, memories for me from the, for the start of World War II. Obviously, World War II started uh, a little uh, earlier. Uh, and Shul, can you just tell us how you and uh, your family uh, were, were captured by the Nazis in Hungary in, in 1944? Uh, uh, first from Yugoslavia, uh, 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 the moment that my father, that was on reserve duty in, in, in 41, joined us, we had a choice to obey the German orders that called us uh, to <clears throat> report somewhere uh, and uh, with uh, the uh, and they stated on <clears throat> that those Jews that will not obey the orders will be shot uh, shot or or to try to escape to Hungary with with the uh, uh, danger that escaping there, the, the Hungarian uh, uh, border police will uh, detect us, find out that we are Jews, will kill us or return us to the Germans. So we had, uh, we have been in very bad situation. Anyhow, uh, 
my parents decided to still escape to Hungary. And in Hungary, finally, uh, when the, in 44, the Germans entered very little military forces, mainly Eichmann uh, with his units, what they uh, very, uh, with nice words, they called the solution of the Jewish problem, meaning their elimination. Uh, uh, they first tried uh, to uh, hide me uh, in a mon monastery, but uh, uh, I was extremely uh, 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 fear, fear that, that uh, they will detect. I was at age eight, they will detect that I am uh, Jewish and they will be killed. And uh, that was traumatic for me, although they uh, uh, never did anything bad to me. Uh, uh, but later I was taken out, uh, been taken to uh, the ghetto of Budapest. Stay, we stayed there around uh, two months, and then uh, we were taken to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen, uh, we, we have been for about uh, half a year, and uh, I have be very bad me memories. The British. Uh, 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 have uh, 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 much, much uh, information about Bergen-Belsen because that was the first uh, uh, concentration camp that the British have liberated in '45 and that detected those awful things that uh, they were able to see with their own uh, eyes. And it is fully do documented. I, I have seen uh, the documents in the Imperial Museum in London about it. Uh, I, I have awful memories from there because of the hunger, uh, uh, mainly the hunger, uh, the hunger. And uh, may I believe that uh, they stayed during uh, the, the whole period of the Holocaust that forged uh, my character for the rest of my life. And uh, 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 of being able to take some uh, unpleasant feelings that you need when you are uh, racing, uh, racing and uh, uh, struggle, struggling uh, to survive or to, to win, to win a race. And uh, 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 that uh, stayed stayed for me all, all my uh, all my life. Uh, 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 initially, setting a goal uh, uh, to try uh, a low goal to try to achieve it, and when I achieved it, to set an additional goal, and so on and so on. And uh, I believe that I have achieved. Most of my goals, uh, uh, I had even uh, very nice memories uh, in Great Britain. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, important and famous walking competitions in the world was the London to Brighton walk. Nice. Uh, 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 first, first time I participated in it in 1970 and won it. Uh, oh, amazing! Uh, 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 winning it uh, after that uh, that race was won previously by eight uh, uh, Olympic gold medalists in walking. In walking, amazing, my, amazing. My uh, and uh, and, sure, and sure you uh, you know your your family uh, made Alia to uh, Israel uh, from um, uh, Switzerland in in forty eight. Um, obviously, you developed uh, an incredible uh, skill and realized you had an incredible athletic ability. Uh, you, you represented um, Israel in the uh, 1968 Olympic Games in, in Mexico. But share with us what it was like to be in Munich for the 1972 um, Olympic Games, to be on German, German soil and, and everything that you've experienced in the Holocaust. 
but this time uh, wearing the Star of David belonging to the modern state of Israel. What was that like? First, I have been, I, even before 1972 in Germany, uh, and my general behavior was that uh, I never uh, made any contact with anybody that, uh, according to my estimation, uh, age estimation, might have been involved in the uh, in the Nazi par party's uh, uh, activities. Uh, I was uh, uh, involved only with, with the younger generation. But by coming to Munich, that was a special feeling. Special feeling, uh, uh, first, the, Germ uh, the German authorities wanted to show the world in, uh, by organizing the 72 Olympic Games, that uh, uh, the West Germany of that time is totally different than the Third Reich, the, the, uh, the democratic uh, society. Uh, 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 I, as an Israeli, I wanted to end with the experience of the horrors uh, of, the, of the Holocaust, I wanted to show the world, the world, both the Germans, here we are, despite the fact that you tried to kill us, to eliminate us, we are still here. We are able to uh, compete with the rest of the world at the sa same level. And I marched proudly uh, on the German soil. Uh, by the way, local uh, newspapers, uh, have uh, uh, published an article on me there in Munich uh, with a, a caption, uh, Shaul Adani is uh, walking on familiar ground. <laughs> Obviously, uh, meaning that I have been doing the, uh, the Holocaust uh, in Germany. Uh, Amazing. Uh, and, um, uh, and Shul, can you tell us uh, what happened on that uh, fateful evening of September the 5th, uh, 1972, uh, in, in which uh, PLO terrorists belonging to Black September um, kidnapped uh, Israeli athletes? Uh, describe for us what, what happened on that horrific day. Uh, uh, first, I, I have to start with the evening before. Evening before, on 4th of September, eh, the whole, eh, that was my first free day after my competition. The whole team was invited to a gala performance eh, eh, in a theater eh, in eh, the center of Munich, eh, eh, playing eh, Fiddler on the Roof, a Jewish, eh, Jewish play with uh, one of the most famous uh, is Israeli actors playing Tovia. And uh, we, uh, at the middle of uh, the pose, middle of the uh, uh, play, uh, we were invited to the backstage uh, and took, took a common uh, uh, picture. Uh, many on those uh, pictures, uh, 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 died uh, after a few hours. Returning, returning uh, to the Olympic Village close to midnight, uh, one of the coaches, uh, uh, nicknamed Mumi, Moshe Weinberg, asked me to uh, 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 lend him uh, my alarm clock, and uh, I said, I will bring it to him after returning from the dining room at around one o'clock in the morning. I brought him that, that clock, set it to around five o'clock in the morning. He said he has to uh, awake and, uh, and take uh, one of his uh, athletes, uh, Mark Slavin, for weighing from apartment number three. He was staying in apartment one, and I was staying 
with five others in between them in a, a in apartment two. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is. Uh, this is the scenery. Now around uh, uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, I, I was sleeping on my bed uh, in apartment two in the uh, uh, rear, uh, rear uh, uh, bedroom. Uh, I am touched and somebody uh, 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 tells me Muni was killed by Arabs. I just uh, opened my eye. That was Zelig from the second floor of my apartment. We had a spiral staircase in the, in the, the, in the apartment and uh, he disappeared. Uh, uh, without thinking, uh, first I opened my, my uh, eyes. I noticed my uh, uh, roommate was already sitting on his bed and starting to dress up. And without thinking, I slipped my feet into my walking shoes. And as I was in pajamas, I went out of the, of the bedroom to the front door of the apartment, opened it, it opened to the ins inside, and stood there. I looked looked for, based on what uh, Zelik said, some vi violent action. I did not see any viol violence, but I noticed something was going on in front of the entrance uh, to apartment one. Somebody with a darker skin, a hat, was looking. Uh, Ahead, he did not turn his uh, head to, to the left. I was around four to four and a half meters from him altogether. And but because in front of him, there were four uniform guards uh, of the Olympic village, two of them women, none of them had any arms. Uh, that was the customs uh, there. And uh, I stood there and uh, listened to the conversation. The, uh, uh, one of the lady guards asked that uh, uh, that person, the dark skin uh, person, to allow the Red Cross to enter uh, and to provide some aid to somebody. And he refused. And uh, she wanted to try to convince him uh, still to allow uh, that, and she said, you should be humane. And he replied, the Jews are not humane either. Uh, uh, I, I understood from that that really something serious is, go is going on. By the way, later on, we found out that uh, that uh, a person besides me, uh, uh, was the head of the terrorist group uh, 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 called ISA. I, I, I retreated in the apartment, uh, closed the entrance door, uh, uh, climbed the spiral staircase to the second floor. All the five others were fully dressed already in the, there on the second floor in the front uh, bedroom. And I asked what happened. They said they the first uh, 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 they have pointed through the front window uh, to the floor uh, floor in front of the uh, entrance to apartment one, and, and told me, "Do you see that uh, uh, dark stain there? Uh, there? Uh, that is from the blood of uh, Muni. His body was uh, there before." In the meantime, it was taken away. Then somebody said, oh, yeah, the, yeah, those Arab terrorists might try to catch us too. Let us uh, get out. We all descended the spiral staircase to my bedroom on the rear side. And I remember somebody just uh, 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 shifted the, uh, on the uh, 
rear side, they, they had a, a sliding glass door, opened it, went on to the uh, terrace. There was a narrow terrace at the le same level as the lawn. He went there and started to run in zigzags and disappeared. And all the rest uh, in my, uh, that were with me there uh, uh, have done the same to escape from the uh, building. In the meantime, I was uh, uh, dressing up my uh, track suit over, over my pajamas. As I finished dressing up the, uh, the, the, that uh, track suit, all the five from my apartment already disappeared. I went out there to the terrace and instead of escaping, walked along the rear side of the building eh, to warn the chief of the mission in apartment number five. I knocked on his uh, glass do door. He turned eh, eh, the curtain, saw me, let me in. I asked him, do you know? He said, yes, but eh, come in. I want to warn the, uh, uh, the members of the Israeli Olympic uh, uh, Committee that are staying in hotels in, uh, in the city. And so when he uh, finished, uh, he finished, he, he called, we left, we, we left through the same uh, 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 sliding door and uh, terrace where I entered on the rear side, we left there and we walked, we walked uh, on the sloping lawn and uh, uh, just by turning right until we got to the basement level where already armed uh, poli policemen uh, uh, were and they directed us to the uh, uh, headquarters of the Olympic Village. Amazing. We only got uh, about four minutes left uh, of this really uh, incredible interview, Shaw. Um, should the uh, the Munich Olympics have been cancelled after that horrific uh, tragedy and murder of the Israeli athletes? And we're so grateful that you were able to survive and tell your story. But should the Olympic Committee have said no and, and cancelled the Munich Games, in your opinion, straight after that awful massacre by Black September? Uh, the advice or the request uh, uh, for retreat of the Israeli uh, Olympic, uh, remaining Olympic team and uh, the, uh, the request that the Olympic Games should be cancelled came from the Israeli prime minister that uh, was never an athlete, never a sportsman. And I, I believe that in this case, did not understand fully the situation. The Israeli uh, 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 officials, uh, Olympic officials, uh, followed the request of the prime minister. I was the only one there uh, that uh, loudly stated my opinion. I had no, I was older than most of the others. I was the only uh, uh, Holocaust survivor. I was 36 years old, already a lecturer uh, at, at the Tel Aviv University. I loudly stated my opinion, which is totally different, but obviously, uh, it had no impact. I had uh, uh, no, uh, no official position except of being one of the athletes. I, I stated A, that the, uh, many Arab countries uh, tried for years to kick out uh, uh, Israelis from all the uh, sports arenas, forums, unsuccessfully. Now, after that, they have killed 11 uh, of our, our, our members. Now, with our own uh, 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 
own uh, decision, we are disappearing from the Olympic Games and providing them uh, the satisfaction that they have been able to fulfill the, the, their wish and their policies. That's one. Second, uh, uh, there at the Olympic Games, there were uh, participating about 10,000 athletes that for uh, uh, many years trained for that opportunity to get to the Olympic Games and to show for themselves, their families, their friends, and the rest of the world, what they are able to do. Uh, uh, Israel should not punish them by, by stopping, stopping the games. They would hate us, hate, hate, hate us. And then they, they were about a, a 2 billion of spectators that uh, 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 planned uh, to uh, enjoy watching watching the games. And if we would have taken away the, uh, that opportunity, they would have hated us. Uh, like, let's say, the British, if there is uh, in uh, Honduras uh, so, uh, uh, some strategy that's not the most important thing in their mind. I, 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 so I, finally, I, I, fine, I thought fine. that that would be a, a tremendous mistake, and I am very happy that the Olympic Games continued. Absolutely. Uh, and, and finally, Shaw, what are your thoughts on the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, Munich Olympics of 1972? And, and do you think the world has learned any lessons from the horrors that took place at those Olympics in which you were a survivor? Yeah. Yeah. In 1972, uh, the... the belief the belief uh, of everybody was that the olympic games are uh, uh, constructed in the framework of the ancient olympic games which meant that no uh, uh, that every type of atrocity every type of violence uh, stops taboo taboo uh, uh, at the Olympic Games, it is a peaceful event. Nothing, nothing will ever happen. That was the belief. That was the belief. Uh, in 1972, that belief was uh, shattered. Since then, since then, uh, 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 at all sports events, yeah. Uh, various uh, security measures are uh, being taken and uh, uh, also by various groups uh, uh, try to use uh, that stage stage to claim whatever they want to claim to claim you probably remember that in Paris there was an attempt uh, to blow up a uh, a, a football match uh, 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 in Atlanta Olympic Games. Some bombs exploded in a park uh, besides the, the Olympic Village and so on. So to, today, uh, uh, the, uh, coming to the Olympic Games is not the same fun as it used to be uh, before. Yeah. But uh, but uh, the, uh, whether the uh, human nature has changed, human nature has not changed. Uh, uh, in, in the past, there were wars, and we see that we have wars even today. Uh, today, unfortunately, and unfortunately, atrocities might happen in the 
in the future too. So Professor Shul uh, Ladini, I just want to thank you so much for being uh, today's uh, special guest on Behind the Headlines. Thank you so much for sharing your, your incredible story. Uh, you are uh, an Olympic Israeli hero, you're a world record breaker, you're a survivor of the Holocaust and also a survivor of the uh, Munich Olympics of 72. And uh, we just really appreciate you telling your amazing story. Uh, and you've achieved so much in your lifetime that it would probably take three people to, in three lifetimes to come anywhere close to what you've achieved in your life. So we thank you so much uh, for you and uh, your ability to, to fight and endure what it seems to be absolutely impossible to endure. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me and hearing my story. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, many other athletes will continue uh, to have sports as the way of life. And uh, we're very, very privileged to have that interview on this program today, a survivor of the uh, Munich massacre of 1972. So, I mean, what is so extraordinary uh, um, uh, about uh, Professor Shaw uh, Ladani is not only is he a Holocaust survivor, he survived the Holocaust. Mm. Uh, he then, when he was 18, uh, uh, ran his first marathon. And then he found out that he was actually exceptionally good at kind of race walking and uh, represented Israel at race walking. He's a world record holder still to this day at I think 50 kilometer race walking. Wow. Um, and uh, as I said in the interview there as well, competed in two Olympics, the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico for Israel and also the, uh, also the Olympic Games in Munich in 72. He's also a university uh, professor at Ben Gurion uh, University uh, in science and engineering. He's written 300 books, uh, an absolute, absolute gem of a guy, absolute gem. So thanks to the Israeli embassy for uh, setting that up for us, uh, which is very special. And it's so important, I think, to get these first-hand accounts of actually what happened because, you know, after Munich 1972, everything changed. Uh, security became a big issue and, uh, and this became something very important. And I think also then also Israel realised as well, the Israeli authorities, that they can't trust any other foreign government to look after their own citizens. This is something that Israel has to do. Now, I, I don't know if you, you've seen the film, but there was a film produced in 2005 called uh, Munich. Uh, Israel, straight after the um, murder of these nine Israeli athletes, launched an operation called uh, Grapes of Wrath. It was a Mossad operation and it was a covert uh, assassination campaign carried out by Israel um, to avenge the kidnapping and murder of the 11 Israeli athletes by Palestinian terrorists in September 1972 at the Olympic Games. And, and, and really, this was Israel's response by saying that... Uh, enough's enough and one of the most amazing operations i don't know if if you've you've heard of this but israel's former prime minister ahud barak also chief of staff um was involved in a, a raid in lebanon where they knew that uh, some of the members of the plo that had actually carried out this horrendous terrorist attack on the israeli athletes um went into beirut and ahud uh, barak was was dressed up as a woman uh, oh. in that operation um, so the, the film actually goes through the emotional trauma of those Israeli assassins um, actually carrying out the operation to assassinate as many of these uh, Palestinian uh, terrorists that were responsible for Munich. But ultimately, the ultimate responsibility uh, fell on the shoulders of, uh, of the chairman of the PLO, Yasser Arafat. Yeah, abs absolutely. Every single hostage was slain, as we've already heard. Uh, it was a tragedy, it was chaotic, and uh, the aftermath demanded retribution. It's, it's interesting, you know, every athlete was slain, but there were three hostages who survived. So uh, even in the, the chaos, uh, the marksmen who West Germany had assigned um, to do this particular mission failed to complete the mission in relation to these th three hostages who were then released by West Germany um, to, uh, you know, in, in exchange for some cabin crew members, uh, uh, Lufthansa flight that had been hijacked. 
um, uh, f for the same purpose. So again, you can look at it and you can see the whole thing was very messy. It was not handled um, in a great way. The other five um, terrorists had died in that gun battle, but um, these three and anyone who was connected, anyone who was connected, not just to these terrorists, but it was connected to Black September, um, w was authorized to be assassinated. Mossad had never really done anything quite on that same scale, quite on that same level, um, but such was the crime against these athletes that um, there needed to be some just retribution in this way. Historically, they had targeted leaders of organizations like Fatah, uh, PLO, uh, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, um, but this type of mission was definitely unique. Also what's so important as well, I think also going back to this era of the late 1960s and uh, going into the 70s, particularly in Europe, was uh, uh, the age of kind of terrorism where we, we saw a lot of planes being hijacked, we saw a lot of assassinations at major banks and corporations, major terrorist attacks are like the PLO would be very much linked to uh, as you see in the film, uh, and also the story of Entebbe, um, a link to kind of Marxist communists uh, mm. in, in, in Germany. There was also then links to the IRA as well. So these were all the kind of attacks that were going across uh, Europe in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and what happened is that European governments ended up paying ransom money to these terrorist organizations. And this is how the PLO got extremely rich. They would pay them not to carry out terrorist attacks um, on their territory. That's why they end up being extremely soft mm. and letting a lot of these terrorists go. So, uh, I mean, this is a legacy and it was a kind of wake up call to, to, the, to the Western world to realize that, you know, um, Palestinian terrorism then didn't have that Islamist element that it has now. Um, so many of these were actually uh, secular members of the, uh, of the PLO that were carried out these attacks. They influenced by kind of Marxist ideology. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to raise the profile of, of the Palestinian cause. So we have to kind of realize then at the same time at this, during this era, that the whole concept of the identity of the Palestinians came to the forefront. This is this is helped through through uh, President Nasser of Egypt and uh, Yasser Arafat to create uh, a Palestinian identity as a people in order to use that against Israel. An identity tragically rooted in acts of terror. Absolutely. Uh, the hit squad first targeted Val Zvater, who was a PLO organizer and also a cousin of Yasser Arafat. He was shot in the lobby of his Rome apartment building in October of 1972. This was followed by Mahmoud Hamshari, the PLO representative in Paris. So um, th they were not shy of targeting these individuals across European cities um, and carried out their uh, endeavor with a great deal of precision. Now, uh, there are unpublished files r related to the Munich massacre. Those are being released, is my understanding. Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, which, is, which is really, really important. So according to the uh, Times of Israel, uh, published on the 22nd of uh, July uh, of this year, 2022, authorities in Bavaria say that they are releasing all uh, previous unpublished files on the attack on the 1972 Munich Olympics following criticism from relatives of the 11 Israeli athletes and coaches who were murdered. Uh, we got uh, Joachim uh, Herman, who's the top security official in the southern uh, German state, uh, said that uh, Bavaria will no longer keep any files under wraps, uh, but is conceded that federal authorities might still hold confidential files. Uh, the Palestinian group uh, Black September took a number of members of the Israeli team hostage on the 5th of September 1972 with the goal of forcing the release of prisoners held by Israel and two left-wing extremists in West Germany jails. 11 Israelis and a West German police officer were killed during the terrible botched rescue attempt. Um, so there has been complaints about this. There, there was controversy at uh, the London Olympics as well mm. in uh, 2012, uh, when, when Israel and the Jewish community said that, uh, that in the opening ceremony to mark uh, London 2012, there should be a reference made to what happened in Munich in 72. 
as it was the 40th anniversary and now we're in the uh, literally the 50th anniversary, 10 years on. Uh, what was there, I'm trying to remember, I have a vague memory that there was some reference to that, but was there a, a set moment to commemorate it at the opening? Not at the opening. I think there's something did happen. Like, I mean, the Jewish on. community, the Israeli embassy um, organised a, a vigil for those uh, murdered Israeli athletes, mm -hmm. um, and they had a special service for them. I think something did take place at the Olympics, but it wasn't on the opening night right. uh, and stuff as well. So, I mean, really, I, I suppose we have to look back and say how the tragedy or the massacre known as the 1972 um, the Olympic Games is a kind of reminder to us all of the wake up of the horrors of terrorism and the need for security and the need to protect athletes, particularly Israeli athletes who who are either like uh, um, Shaul himself was, was a Holocaust survivor, who survived the Holocaust, was in Bergen-Belsen, or other Israeli athletes that had family members die in the Holocaust as well. Uh, and to realise that again, this tragedy happened on German soil. Uh, and the lesson is, have we actually learned the lessons from Munich? Well, uh, there remains security concerns. There have been multiple football tours um, as well that have had to be called off or cancelled over security concerns, various athletic events wherein there's uh, definitely going to be some uh, f form of, of trouble. Um, it, it's been reassuring to see th th this seemingly tail off in re regards to uh, particularly targeting Israeli athletes, but uh, the problems still persist. The PLO still active, uh, other organizations associated with them is still operating. We talk about them on a fairly regular basis on this program, and uh, it's, it's right that we continue to pray for um, for, for Israel, for its people, for the peace uh, of Jerusalem, and in, indeed that, that there would be um, an end to all of this madness. Absolutely, and of course sport is not about politics, so uh, this is also another kind of reminder of the Olympic Games as well, that um, this is about the athletes, this is about elite athletes competing at the highest level of sport in their, in their sport to gain a crown, which is uh, Olympic glory. Uh, and to go down as kind of legends within their own country. That's what it's about. It, it's not at all about kind of terrorism or political causes in, in which uh, athletes are murdered because of a political cause, uh, as we saw with the, uh, with the PLO and Black September. Uh, Reagan, uh, thank you so much for, for joining me as we, we mark the 50th anniversary of the uh, Munich massacre of the 1972 Olympic Games. And I want to thank you all for watching uh, tonight's Behind Headlines as we mark the 50th anniversary of the uh, massacre at the 1972 Munich Olympics. And I think it's a reminder to us all of the horror that can take place if uh, proper security guarantees are not put in. So we dedicate this programme to those 11 Israeli athletes murdered at Munich. So thank you for watching tonight's Behind Headlines.